everybody together. Okay, so our last speaker is Ernesto Diaz. He's the director of the Coastal Management and Climate Change Office, which is part of the Puerto Rican Department of Natural and Environmental Resources here in San Juan. He's the also the current coordinator of the Puerto Rico Climate uh, Change Council. He holds degrees in oceanography, in coastal and marine biology, and in engineering management. And he's a great example of a jack of all trade. He's got formal training in areas like remote sensing, strategic planning, climate change, adaptation, and uh, national uh, disaster preparedness. So please join me in welcoming Ernesto Diaz. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to Aslo and Ori for having for inviting me to share part of our work with this uh, wonderful audience and uh, colleagues, uh, many. Um, I'll, you know, it's a privilege to speak after do Dr. Scofield, and I'll benefit from some of his examples. Uh, there are some uh, of his final conclusions and recommendations that I'll be emphasizing in, and we haven't coordinated uh, the <laughs> presentations, but I, it was fascinating to, to listen to him. Thank you and congratulations on your award. So I'll be speaking and presenting some key messages in this first slide, in case that they throw me out of the stage, uh, if I run out over time. I'll be speaking a bit about the state of the Puerto Rico climate, what we know, also what we don't know, and we want to know. I'll be speaking about a recently published chapter on the U.S. Caribbean and the National Climate Assessment, and we, how we delivered uh, six key messages to, for uh, adaptation and building resilience in, in the Caribbean. I'll speak a bit about uh, science to policy. Uh, and this is something that we all know. S policymakers are more interested in research evidence than in science per se. You know, I was fascinated by the presentation, but to get to a policymaker, a regulator, uh, we need to fill that gap. You know, how to you know elevate our speeches, how to be effective at communicating what the graphs and, and the data that we gather and analyze uh, show. From Maria and from previous uh, events, we have learned that extreme events, frequency, and natural disasters provide strong evidence. So we have used an a unfortunate event like Maria to create a positive out of it. I'll be reinforcing that point through an ongoing case study, which is uh, to try to get eligibility from FEMA public assistance for wetlands, dunes, and coral reefs as natural infrastructure. So who doesn't know that uh, coral reefs attenuate energy and protect the coastal areas, or wider beaches, or dunes, or wetlands, protect coastal communities and critical infrastructure? Well, they are not eligible. So we got to make the connection to policymakers and make those infrastructure eligible for funding to, to get that protection of these ecosystem services and natural infrastructure. So the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council, uh, many of whom are here, is a voluntary association of over 150 members and collaborators convened to assess the state of the Puerto Rico climate using the best science and knowledge available, understand Puerto Rico's social ecological vulnerabilities and develop adaptation strategies to build a resilient society. Members and collaborators uh, are representatives of federal agencies, commonwealth agencies, local and international universities, NGOs, independent researchers, private uh, companies, anyone that's interested in the subject and has something to uh, present and, and, and to be shared with the group you know, is, is welcome. And we work through uh, four different uh, working groups. Um, a first group that's more related to what ASLO colleagues uh, do is the Geophysical and Chemical Scientific Knowledge Working Group that gathers 
follows up on what's uh, the state of the science uh, worldwide, uh, what uh, is generated here locally, and assesses the, the science and presents it to working group two that uh, using a modified VCAPS method, uh, evaluates the effects, impacts, and consequences on ecology and biodiversity. That information from gro working groups one and two is then presented to the working group three, society and economy, and the effects and impacts on coastal communities, uh, critical infrastructure, and biodiversity are assessed by economists, planners, etc. And that information is communicated, and I'm here presenting part of those results and information. Uh, we also publish our State of the Climate Report. Our first report was uh, published in 2014. Then we developed, based on that information, our guidance, Road to Resilience. And after Maria, we're reviewing those uh, recommendations that we had in terms of, road, uh, of, of building resilience. I'll be talking a bit more about it in, uh, through the next slides. We also uh, evaluate uh, public perception and uh, we, you know, try to understand what's the, the, what, what the community and the population think about climate change, their risks, and their vulnerabilities. You know, being over 150 members, uh, we don't have the opportunity to meet regularly. So we have uh, what we call the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council Summit once a year, and then we interact electronically via a listserv, uh, a very animated Google group, where not only the data and the information is shared, but some hot issues are discussed, and it gets pretty interesting. <laughs> so our reports feed into the US uh, Global Change Research Program reports, uh, some of go into the uh, spe special climate science uh, report and the National Climate Assessment, and uh, subsequently is also used by the IPCC in the international or global reports, and we definitely benefit from all the research and modeling conducted at those instances. This is our fin a photo of our final authors meeting, March 2018. We were so relieved that we had completed our chapter, not so fast. We, then the processing of, you know, fine-tuning the document took all the way to September, and that's when we really finalized the document. That was a release on 2018, November. And this is the, how our report, our chapter looks. It, it is our first standalone chapter in the National Climate Assessment Report. Previously, we were part of the Southeast and Caribbean uh, chapter. And uh, we were like a couple of sentences or a paragraph in the chapter. So we demanded to have our own chapter and we uh, took the, 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 cha the challenge and, and you know, we're very proud of what we did. So in our report, we summarize the state of the knowledge, scientific knowledge uh, for the Caribbean uh, we're very different from Florida, even though we have s similarities. Uh, our reality is different, so we presented the state of the scientific knowledge for the area, and we delivered uh, six uh, key messages uh, on fresh water, marine resources, coastal systems, rising temperatures, how we respond to disasters, and, and this was developed before Maria. We had to make some amendments uh, after Maria, definitely. And then uh, an, another important uh, message is about adaptive capacity. I'm not gonna go through all the specific graphs, but we follow very closely what goes on. For example, you know, Mauna Loa, CO2, atmospheric con concentration, that graph is from two days ago. We follow up very closely altimetry data, uh, uh, our tidal gauges, and develop you know, the trends analysis. Uh, we report on that, and for example, uh, in terms of precipitation, uh, we didn't have a, uh, models that would resolve effectively for a small uh, landmass like uh, Puerto Rico and the USVI, so we asked 
uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe from Texas Tech to help us to downscale that data in 2012. She uh, and her team completed that information using our data. So that was our first uh, kind of more approximate to reality uh, approach to knowing our projections in terms of precipitation and temperatures. Uh, so after that, uh, the Southeast Climate Center, Dr. Adam Terrando, uh, Jared Bowden, and uh, Asset Nasari uh, helped us dynamically downscale that information and the projection is that we'll have a reduction uh, of at least 10% of pre precipitation by 2060 while compared to the uh, previous 85 to 25 uh, decades. In terms of ocean chemistry, and both are here, uh, Professor Julio Morel and PH candidate uh, Melissa Melendez uh, from the University of Puerto Rico and CARICUS help us uh, monitor a CO2 concentration at La Parguera. I think that you are going there tomorrow, a couple of you. I hope you enjoy this, a great uh, place. Uh, and see uh, water pH as well as sea surface temperature. Those, you know, CARICUS is one of our greatest science providers, so we collect that information and, and as part of the working group uh, one uh, reports. In terms of sea level rise, uh, Professor Aurelio Mercado from the University of Puerto Rico just retired, and myself keep track of all the altimetry data and the tide uh, gauges uh, records and recognize the trends. Then we feed that information into the joint Army Corps of Engineers NOAA calculators, and we get kind of the low intermediate, intermediate, and extreme uh, uh, projections. This one, uh, are reviewed, uh, peer reviewed by Dr. Billy Sweet of NOAA. So he helped us uh, kind of fine tune the, the information that uh, was presented at the National Climate Assessment uh, chapter. And we follow up that very closely, but what's the effects and impacts on coastal communities, on uh, critical infrastructure and habitats, biodiversity? So. We're concerned because 61% of our population live in the 44 coastal municipalities of Puerto Rico within one kilometer of the coastal zone strip. Uh, we also have uh, information from Dr. Maritza Barreto uh, that 60% of our 1,225 beaches experience moderate to severe erosion. So obviously that uh, brings closer the risk factor to um, uh, those areas that have been developed. Most of our economic activity occurs in the coastal zone and also in the metro area where I'm going to be focusing for the next couple of slides uh, is where most of the activity and the critical infrastructure is located. You know, 11 airports, 12 airports are located in the coastal zone. Also, 90% of our natural reserves are uh, coastal or marine. We have hospitals, we have uh, where our communications and fiber optic cables land and depart for other islands. All our power generation plants uh, uh, are located in, in the coastal zone and a lot of sanitary infrastructure, electric power authority and schools and historic uh, places are uh, you know, at risk if we don't do something effectively at, at that. So, this is a, a, a picture that reflects what I've been just presenting, uh, you know, critical infrastructure and uh, real estate development, tourism resorts uh, developed at a very low elevation above mean sea level. This is the international airport where you probably landed. There are probably some hotels where you're staying at. They are very close to the area and at risk. And I'll be talking a lot about uh, vulnerability and risks uh, for the next slides. And uh, this is our, the, the type of power plants that we are uh, using up to now. There is a huge drive uh, towards uh, getting a transition either to natural gas for a couple of years while uh, uh, recognizing the need to move 100% to solar or renewables uh, but this is what we have right now, uh, seven 
power plants located at very uh, close distance from risk factors in the coastal areas. And this is of great concern too. This is aging infrastructure that was developed mostly during the 60s and 70s. Uh, Prasa, the Puerto Rico Aquatic and Source Authority, recognizes that uh, close to 50% of the water they treat is lost to uh, ruptures in their transmission uh, pipes. Even though we don't have uh, ample tidal range, uh, we have what are called the blue skies floods when the inversion of gradients from the uh, coastal lagoons or near shore environments uh, kind of produce a return to the sewer, um, storm sewer management uh, systems. And this is the type of uh, events that we face. I know that they are common in, in Fort Lauderdale and, and, and the East Coast. So uh, that's something that we have to deal with and, and very soon. We also f uh, face this type of uh, floods during um, extreme events, rain events, and these ones during flash floods, and they disrupt uh, social functioning in, in our cities and towns. But we made ourselves vulnerable. I don't want to Monday morning quarterback this, but in the late 1800s, a lot of wetlands and agricultural lands were filled, and this is what we have right now in the San Juan metro area. A lot of impervious surfaces and low capacity to handle uh, stream uh, flows and, and, and uh, rain uh, stream events. The projections of sea, sea level rise uh, are also not encouraging. And uh, we have been promoting uh, strategies to, to effectively address these issues, particularly with the Army Corps of Engineers that has uh, some projects uh, to channel and modify some hydrological systems. And we are requesting that based on their mandate that they have a circular letter that demands that sea level rise is integrated into all their civil works, uh, effectively in incorporate at least you know, the intermediate uh, level uh, of floods uh, that, that we expect as uh, sea level uh, rises. When we uh, conduct our public uh, perception studies, the most common question, even before Maria, is how will storms and hurricanes uh, be in the future? Will there be more intense? We typically tell them that because of ocean warming and, and sea surface temperature increases, they probably be more intense. We are not able to predict our crystal ball doesn't work that effectively in terms of frequency. But in 2017, we had the most active um, hurricane season in the Atlantic in record, and we had a uh, very close scare with Irma, a Cat 5 hurricane that went just north of us and landed in, in, in Florida. And uh, also Maria that went through us, uh, you know, from the southeast to the northwest, creating a storm surge of 6.03 uh, feet. And on the southern part of the Puerto Rico, even reported at eight feet by the US uh, Geological Survey and exiting with a storm surge of uh, four feet, this surge, we lost pa power. And we were declared a major disaster area. I believe that Adam Monson yesterday spoke in extensively about this, so I, don't wo I won't go that much into it. But being declared a major disaster uh, event, uh, we recognize that Obviously, we had to re recover and, and respond effectively, but uh, there were some opportunities that we had to seize as scientists there. I, my team and, and colleagues from the American Society of Civil Engineering, New York City of Puerto Rico, a Civil Engineering Department, uh, actually Maria Falcon and Adam Monson went in some of our inspections too and documented this, we visited over 500 sites, but particularly for beach debris removal, we visited 370. 
And this is what we encountered. So on the lower right-hand corner, it was the, those are mangroves that were drowned uh, because of you know, the inability of water to exit the channels that were plugged with sand from the uh, surge and the wave uh, events. And waves were not only scary and attacked those areas that I showed as you know, uh, destroyed and, and affected by the, the hurricane and ocean forces. And this is the type of waste that I'm talking about. This is during March 2018. You see the blue skies. That's not the hurricane's waves. But this, that's a three-footer. And actually, the one riding that wave is a physical oceanographer, Dr. Miguel Canals, who will be speaking about uh, in a, a, a little bit uh, about some simulations that he made and that were very effective in the work that we're uh, trying to, to present before uh, FEMA. So imagine that wave on top of a six-foot storm surge. So you have 36 to 42 uh, feet uh, wave. This is something that regularly we face in coastal areas. That's a before-after picture. This is before Irma Maria, and this is 2018, how the beach is completely gone. And this is the result at Rincon, and I'll be using this as a reference for the next couple of minutes. This more damage uh, uh, resulting from wave attack in Rincon. And this is where I'm going to be focusing for the next couple of uh, slides and the final discussion of the events and how we can translate science, major disasters into policy and funding for our you know, resiliency building initiatives. So we have identified traditional active erosion sites. They are presented, highlighted in circles there. But we didn't see major wave attack affecting infrastructure here. The metro area was floated for a couple of days. You know, the, the people were with water up above their knees for a couple of days. But coral reefs, the coastal barrier uh, in the San Juan metro area attenuated wave energy. And I'll be presenting the simulation on, on this very issue and protected this area. So it functioned as a perfect infrastructure that we, you know, we, we need to recuperate in order to keep it in place. So uh, for future disasters, uh, we still have a uh, working uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are concerned, as I mentioned, that uh, the San Juan metro area uh, houses most of the real estate and, and critical infrastructure of the, of the island. And immediately after Maria, uh, I actually the joint forces uh, operations were here in this very building. Close to 16,000 federal employees were deployed immediately after the, the, the hurricane. And I was living in this uh, building for like the next uh, two months after Maria, going in and out, in and out. But this, this was the headquarters of the FEMA operation until they moved to an, another building where they are still working at. So we requested, I uh, was the person charged to do the resource request form filling for the sunken vessels removal uh, uh, mission for the Mar a beach debris removal mission. It's not easy to get through the bureaucracy of FEMA to get those approved, and much less to get this groundbreaking initiative approved, which was the first ever FEMA-funded damage assessment and triage work. So a lot of our coral scientists are paying close attention to what we're doing here, because this could be the, the groundbreaking moment in which we can embed uh, the recognition of the ecosystem services that reefs, dunes, beaches, and wetlands provide to society, and that recognition be translated into effective restoration immediately after an event. 
you know, such as when a dike, a levee, or, or a flood control pump uh, fails. So we presented, uh, after that damage assessment was completed, uh, the case, and we hope that uh, it is approved, still has not been approved, uh, uh, coral reefs as critical maintained infrastructure. So what was the ask that we presented to FEMA? You know, we wanted to determine that coral systems are eligible for public assistance as a facility, natural infrastructure. So the challenges were to demonstrate that they were an eligible facility, provided the necessary documentation, and if eligible, were not there yet, characterize, initiate project formulation, and develop the scope of work and engage engineering economic teams for cost estimate. The Bible that they use for this is the Papa G, the FEMA Public Assistance Program and Public Guide. If you're not there, you know, specifically identified, it's hard for you to get public assistance from, from FEMA. So what, what we're trying to do is to get a natural infrastructure recognized and embedded for future events uh, as part of the Papa G. Scientists know it. There is plenty of science demonstrating the effectiveness of corals uh, protecting coastal assets. Again, uh, we have the, the our San Juan metro area. Why didn't the area where m the most infrastructure uh, in Puerto Rico get as affected as Rincón, Barceloneta, or Luquillo, because we have the, the coral reefs performing. How was it demonstrated? Uh, Dr. Miguel Canals used uh, information, pressure, and wind information associated to the uh, data that was collected for hurricanes Irma, Maria, and in this case, uh, Storm Riley, and demonstrated the that 94% of the wave energy was attenuated by these coral reefs, you know, the significant wave height that reported here before entering the, the reef area was between 16 and 20 feet. And remember that the significant wave heights are the average of the top third of the, of the waves analyzed for a period of time. So we had larger waves on top of storm surges. Why didn't they affect the, our infrastructure uh, you know, via wave attack as in Rincon? Because the reef was there. And you can see, uh, I don't wanna, okay, here we go. There are some gaps where energy could go there because there were no reefs there. But in Rincon, we didn't have the uh, luxury of this pro uh, natural protection. So. We, we had major loss there. So we presented to FEMA a, and proposed interventions for coral reefs, dunes, and wetlands. I didn't present it for beaches because I had presented it 15 years ago to the Army Corps of Engineers. It had not been approved, but immediately after Maria, supplemental funding was approved for the feasibility studies. So we gotta use those opportunities to get those uh, necessary funding opportunities uh, delivered to us so that we can conduct the, the studies that will increase feasibility of restoring, adaptively restoring our reefs or dunes or wetlands. So we had, what was FEMA requesting from us? A system definition and investment documentation. Uh, uh, Tanya Metz from my office and colleagues uh, and Vanessa Marrero from my office as well as uh, Sean Griffin, Tom Moore, and Michael Nemeth from NOAA worked intensively for two uh, weeks and demonstrated how we had invested in intensively on coral reef maintenance for the past 30 years. And coral reef maintenance takes many forms, from coral farming, to monitoring, to surveillance, to mooring buoys. So all of those are investments to protect that infrastructure. I'm not even talking about the biodiversity, the ecology, or other uh, issues like tourism or recreation that benefit from having uh, thriving coral reefs. We demonstrated also that uh, reefs grow relatively quickly and that they can uh, respond effectively if uh, appropriately restored. 
partners that work in these uh, efforts, uh, have worked in these efforts for the past 30 years, uh, are uh, represented here. And we demonstrated that we had invested close to $60 million for those uh, past 30 years in protecting that natural infrastructure. Swiss Re is a reinsurance company that is doing exactly what we're asking of FEMA. Invest in protecting the reefs so that you can avoid the cost of future disasters that they will come. So we demonstrated that we are an eligible facility, we hope, and that uh, the, we have the legal responsibility, that we are located with a designated area, and that the constructed improvement and maintenance that we have uh, invested in uh, does uh, provide and um, enhances the function. Uh, we need to repair those reefs that were affected, and uh, we are working on, on developing the scope of work and the, and the cost of what we are proposing to do. The evidence proves it. We have final recommendation. Last slide. I'm close to running out of time. So the recommended strategies for interventions are, yet again, and this is a very friendly crowd, protect, restore, and enhance, assist adaptation of coastal barriers such as coral reefs, beaches, dunes, and wetlands, adopt base flood elevation using post-maria conditions that has been adopted, establish a coastal construction line that has, it has done, been done in other jurisdictions, and a special adaptation area based on known erosion rates, wave climate, inundation levels, and sea level rise, update the building code using best science and information available for Puerto Rico, adaptive retrofit, ready design uh, based on sea level rise projections, and I'm not be going to be able to explain what that means, and develop a full disclosure or right to know bill where whomever is going to buy a, a parcel, a lot, or a, a infrastructure is fully aware of the risk that the new property faces. Finally, the risk reduction incentives you know, like planned retreat, transfer of development rights, and density height increases can be used to uh, withdraw uh, infrastructure and communities and new investments from the risk areas. You can find us on Facebook or internet and on the web. Uh, so thank you very much. you can go and have lunch. <laughs> Thank you.